behold, the day of the Lord is coming. Therefore, we shall praise the light of his smile, implore the joy of his salvation, and find our heaven in thee. Let us prepare our hearts to receive and hear God's truth through the preaching of his word, which we start through prayer. Let us pray together. Almighty Father, through your Son, you overcame death and opened to us light, the light of eternity. Enlighten our minds and kindle our hearts with the presence of your Holy Spirit that we may hear your words of comfort and peace. Meet us here and now through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Derek, can you mute on the soundboard all the way to the left? It should be the number one. There should be a mute button. It may be on already. Press it, the light should come on. There you go. Back in 2015, 2016, there was a comedy drama series that aired on NBC. It was based on this premise. Get this premise. This is a, well, well let me tell you the name of the show. You may know. You may know what the premise is. Uh, let's see. The name of the show was called uh, You and Me and the Apocalypse. You and me in the apocalypse. Now, here's the premise of the show. The premise of the show was well, you have, you and me, have 34 days to live because uh, a comet, a world-destroying comet, eight, at least eight miles wide, is on its way. You have 34 days to live. That's the calculation they got, and that's no, no one can do anything about it. And it's coming. And so the, the, that's the premise of the show. The premise of the show is, what would, well, the basic question is, what would you do? What would, what would you do? What would you do if you knew that a, that a worldwide catastrophe was coming? And it's, it's, a, it, it's a comedy series. It was a comedy series. It's a drama comedy series. And it, it's, it's talking about how you're going to live your life, and it goes into all that. But... The fact of the matter is that it's not drama. It's not a comedy series. That's the reality of this world. The reality of this world is this world is going to come to an end. The reality of this world is that, that there will be a catastrophe, and it's coming, and it's the end of the world. It is the end of the world. It is the true apocalypse that the, that the Bible speaks about. So it's not make-believe. It is certainly surreal. But see, there's the question. There's the question for all of us. What do you think about? And, and what would you do if you knew that was coming? Now, as a Christian, you know that's coming. Oh, uh, you do. But do you think about it? Yeah, I, it's funny because I asked that question several times this week to different people. I talk about, hey, you know, the Bible talks about the apocalypse eschatology, the end times, destruction, death. And I, and I ask Christians that very question, hey, what would you, do you ever think about it? Do you ever think about it? And, and, and every one of the people that I asked, including one of my sons, it, it said this, he said, uh, no, I never, I mean, I know it's true. And I know it's going to happen. And my trust is in, is in my Savior. Uh, but I never think about it. I, I, I never, I never stop to really kind of lock horns and, and just think about the end times. And, and so that kind of brings us to what, what would you name? So how will you leave? How, how are you going to live your life? Even as a Christian, how are you going to live your life if total annihilation of the planet was imminent? And it, it is imminent. It, at the end of the world, Christ could return at any moment. Any moment, and he's good. What, what what happens when he does that? 
what happens is that that means it's the end of days. It is the end of humanity as we know it. It is the end of, of the, the age of man, the age of humanity, the end. It's over. God is coming back and he's taking it back. He's taking everything back. It is certainly an apocalyptic, eschatological passage that we're looking at today that was read just now. As, uh, it, as we continue our sermon series, as we conclude our sermon series from the Old Testament book of Zechariah, he is, that's what he's talking about. We're getting an, we get an image, a very graphic and detailed image of the second coming, of the end times. That's what's going on in our passage. That's what's taking place. What we have heard read and what our, what our chapter is about, all of chapter 14, we only had verses 6 through 11 read, but in the, in the chapter in its entirety is about a coronation coming on earth. Now, he, you and I know that Jesus Christ is king and Lord over all of creation, right? As a Christian, we... We amen that. We know he's the king of glory. But is that what the earth, the world, whole world thinks about? Is the, does the whole world agree with us on that? No, they don't. No. They, they don't believe it. They don't agree with that. And so what the passage is, is, is talking about is there's going to be uh, the coming, the second coming of Christ, and that is going to, that's what he's going to reign as king. That's why it says, king over the earth. That means all of humanity. The consummation of human history will occur when Jesus Christ returns to establish his reign over all the earth, over all the people of the earth. And it's coming. It's coming. There is no denying, again, the deity of Christ, but the coronation of him king over the earth is coming at his second coming. That is when he returns, when Jesus Christ returns, he will, no doubt, as verse 9 tells us in our passage, the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one, meaning there is no other Lord. There is no other king on the planet. They're gone. He's it. He's one. He's the one and only king of glory. So here's the big question for, that comes from the passage. Are you ready? Are you ready for that? Are you ready? You know, some of us will think about that. Oh, man, I'm ready. I'm ready for this. But is it going to happen today? Is it going to happen today? Are we leaving today? I don't know. But are you ready? Are you ready for that? That's a that's a heart uh, that's a heartfelt question that only you yourself personally can answer, but without a doubt. To uh, this passage is very clear and vivid. Now, when we get into the passage, I want you to know this, okay? Just from the start, this is a very difficult chapter to interpret. Theologians for centuries. <laughs> I've been working on this, working on this. And they do what theologians do when they try to figure out something. They get it all discombobulated and messed up and confused, okay? But, but let's take it on its face value. Let's take it on what we've been studying, the way we've been studying Zechariah, okay? When, and the reason I'm bringing that up is because this passage covers the millennial kingdom. What, they, what we have called the thousand-year reign of Christ, the millennial kingdom, okay? Now, when we talk about that, when you study something like that, you're going to come up with basically four different views of the millennium. Now, again, the millennium is a thousand-year reign. Now, stay with me, okay? I want you to stay with me. It is when God, Christ reigns. That's the millennium. millennium. Now, we believe that the millennium is going on right now because Christ is reigning. 
The Messiah showed up. He died. He ushered in the millennium. So we call that view a millennial, meaning there's no millennium. We're in it. This is the age of the church. It talks about that in Acts. The age went from the Jewish, the, the nation of Israel, who dropped the ball. And they were said several times, they were said at least a couple of times, that the exile that, we, that we've talked about, the last one was the Babylonian exile. And so God, when Christ comes, they reject the Messiah. And that's when the new age comes, the age of the church. When, where God reigns. God reigns. He sits enthroned on his church. What does that age mean? It means that the gospel message, that salvation, that only comes through the life and work of Jesus Christ, through faith in the life and work of Jesus Christ, that is our salvation. That is the gospel message. And that gospel message by the church has been going around the world. It's, it's been going through all nations and all peoples. And we believe that God is sitting on his throne. He's reigning. Now, that's not his second coming yet, but he is enthroned right now. That's a millennial. Now, there's a couple of other views. One of them is called the premillennial. There's a couple of different views there, and I'll go through them quick, okay? Premillennial means that, that Christ's second coming will occur prior to the, the start of the millennium kingdom, okay? His second coming. So they go, Christ will return, and then a millennium, a thousand-year millennium will start. Okay, that's premillennial. And there's a couple of different twists to that. So that's kind of like two different views of premillennials, premillennium, or premillennialism. And the other view is postmillennial, which is interpreted that Christ's second coming will occur after this millennial season. Okay. Now, I've got you totally confused, but that's, that's what, see, that's what theologians do. That's what we work on. Here's what's going to happen, okay? Here's the fact of the matter. Whatever's going to happen, whatever, is, whatever it talks about, when it talks about Holy Scripture, and it does talk about it in Revelation and other books, it's going to happen whether we understand it or not. Christ is going to return whether we think, oh, man, that, that, wait, he's not supposed to come yet. Uh, I'm not one of those post-millennials. I mean, you know, that, that's going to not make a difference at all. He's going to do what he's going to do. But, but that's kind of what we're looking at. That's kind of what we're looking at when we try to interpret a passage like this. We are living in the millennial age, and we're a millennials. We are living in the age where Christ reigns. Christ reigns. We are living in the end times. According to Scripture, Jesus ushered in the end times, and it certainly started at his crucifixion and resurrection. That's why, when because we're living in the end times, he can return at any time. Now, a people, again, I, get, I hate to bring this dirty word up, but theologians will say, wait a minute, we don't have all the signs of the end times. This is supposed to happen. This is supposed to happen. No, no, no. We're here. We're in it. And he can return at any time. Do you not think this is the end times? Think about what's going on. Think about what's happening today. We have this plague that just won't go away. Hey, look, you could say, ah, it's not really happening. Ah, they're just making it up. Ah, it's a news media deal. It's a creation. I can't even believe those numbers. Yeah, I can't believe the numbers, but everybody around me is getting sick with corona. Or at least they're telling me it's corona. See, that, that's part of it. That's part of it. But what about everything else? What about the woke, the woke culture? The the what is the critical race theory? The what about everything else that's happening today? What about all the politically right things that are going on today? That if you think this or you think that, you're wrong because you're not politically correct. And you don't love everybody. And the thing about a Christian is that we do love everybody. And that means sharing truth, divine truth with them for salvation's sake. Because we're called to do that. We are called to, to do that. So as we look at our passage, we need to remember what's going on. Let's go back to Zechariah and remember what's going on. 
the, the passage, this passage, this prophecy takes place over 400 years before the birth of Christ, okay? Over 400 years before Jesus was born and walked this earth, this, this prophecy is spoken by the, by the prophet. So we have to know that Zechariah is talking to his people back then, but he's also bringing the divine, the sovereign word of God that's speaking to us today at the same time. That's that's what's going on. Today, when we see a passage referring to, to uh, Jer- let's say, Jerusalem, uh, that's the city of God. We, we can interpret that today as the city of God. When, when it talks about, the Old Testament talks about the people of God. Well, today, Paul tells us that we are the people of God. But we are the true Israel. So it, it includes, when we're looking at that, to the passage back then today, we can take heart that when it talks about Jerusalem, it's talking about the city of God, God's people, God's people. That would be us. Now, it could be talking about the geographic area of Jerusalem too, okay? See, remember what's going on in Zechariah? They have just got released from exile. They were given the opportunity to come back home to their homeland of Jerusalem, which God wanted them to do. But guess what? Only a remnant came. A remnant means a small number of a couple of millions, 50,000 came. That's it. Only a remnant showed up back to Jerusalem, and God wanted them back because he wanted to reestablish worship with them. Apparently, they weren't doing a very good job of worshiping God in exile. A remnant comes back. They were, they were instructed to rebuild their houses and rebuild the city, but more than anything, reestablish the worship of God by rebuilding the temple. Remember, that's kind of what's going on. We've gone through the whole book, and now we find out that the temple's built, the priests are in place, and God is still calling the people of, of, of his people back to come to return to me. Come back. Come back home. Come back to me. Because they won't come. And he's told them in the, in, the, in the passages that we've studied before that I will protect you. I will destroy your enemies. I'll take care of that. And he goes into that in this, in this, in this uh, chapter as well. So anyway, so when we look at a chapter like this, we know that Zechariah is talking to his people, but we also know he's talking to us, us today, okay? Zechariah, and, and we know that the city of God, Jerusalem is a heavenly Jerusalem. It's a heavenly city. How do we know that? And it's for God's people, by the way, as I mentioned. But how do we know it's a heavenly Jerusalem? Well, Zechariah 2, verses 4 and 5 tells us it is. This is what God's going to do with his city. He says, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls because of the, uh, the multitude of people and livestock in it. And I will be to her a wall of fire all around, declares the Lord, and I will be the glory in her midst. Okay, so you can imagine the city, it has no walls. So you can imagine the size of this city, now the people coming, and the livestock, and he's going to be a wall of fire. All, and, and, and he's going to be their glory. The glory of in her midst, he will be the glory. Everybody there, we will be glorifying him. He will be our glory. Again, for the people, he, the, that message is going out to the people. He's telling them to come back, to return, to return to me. But the Lord is also calling us as well to come back and worship him, worship him. See, that, that, that's what the church, that was a church, that was the, the age of the church, to come and worship God, to come to him, to come and be part of his people. Like, what's the church? Is it a building? No, it's not a building. The church is the people. The people of God are, are, is what composes the church. And it's global. It's global. That's without walls. And to her glory, right? The glory of God. The glory of God. So as we look at the we look at verse one uh, at, at the beginning of the chapter, uh, it talks about 
the coming of the Lord. Okay, it, it is actually talking about. It's very graphic. It's talking about the apocalypse. You sure you read in the, the apocalypse in that. Okay, but 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 it, but it actually goes back to the chapter before, verse one and two are very graphic. And let me read them to you. It says, Behold, the day is coming for the Lord. When the spoils taken from you will be divided in your midst, for I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken and the houses plundered and the women raped half of the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off. Half the people will go out to exile. Now that goes back to the chapter before. It talks a little bit about it. It talks about the hardships of God's people that they're going to have to endure. We spoke about it last Sunday. Chapter 13, verse 9, the Lord says, I will put this third, these are the, rem the remnants of his people, Jews and Gentiles, I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested, and they will call upon my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, Yahweh is my Elohim. Yahweh is my God. Can you say that? Christ is my God. This is how God brings around, brings about true devotion, dedication to him. And we think about the hardships that we're going through in our lives, and you're going through it. I know you are. Or if you've been through some major hardships. Uh, our loved ones that are not even here are going through it. God allows us to go through these severe hardships to remove the worldliness from our souls, to, from our hearts, so we can trust in him, trust in him, call out to him, cry out to him, needing his grace. We are sent into the fire. Now, we're saved already, but this is the process of sanctification, being made holy. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul spoke about in Acts. Remember, Paul went out there on his missionary journeys out to the world, to the Gentiles, and, and he got almost killed a couple of times, stoned, and he just went through so many hardships, and you would figure he'd come back and tell the people, I'm done. I'm not going back out there anymore. It's too hard. That's not what he says. His brethren, his brothers, his sisters, what he tells them, he says, in Acts 14, 22, it says that, that Paul talks about this. It says, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations, we must, we must enter the kingdom of God. So that we're no strangers to this. We're, we're no strangers to tribulation, okay? And people talk about whether well, the church is going to be taken out before the final tribulation comes and all that. Come on. We've never been taken out before. We're going to endure it till he returns. And then he's going to call us up. God's people have to suffer. Uh, and they did in past times, in Zechariah's time, they suffered through the Babylonian exile, being away from God. And this church is suffering today, certainly suffering today. Uh, the people are being mortared, martyred uh, uh, throughout the world for sharing the gospel. Uh, come on, it's hard for us to believe that in, in the U.S., right? We don't think that anybody would get in trouble for sharing the gospel. But don't you, I mean, it's already happening here where people are not wanting you to share the gospel. That we're not wanting you to, to come together and worship God. There's a, there's, a, there's a plague. Don't you care? Don't you care about the plague? Don't you care about your congregants? They're going to get them sick. They're going to die. That's what they're saying. They said, okay, well, you know what? You don't know, Manny. Pastor Manny, you don't know better. We're just going to have to shut you down. And see, that's kind of what's going on. But see, that's in the U.S. We're able to fight them off and try to survive that. 
But, but in other countries, they don't even allow them to talk about Christ and Christianity for fear of death, for fear of death. In verses, well, as, as, as we look at the passage, we, we know that there's suffering going on with God's people, major suffering going on with God's people. Ah, but see, then the Lord God, he doesn't allow us to perish. He, he writes. In, in, in verses uh, three and four of this chapter, we witness something truly amazing, amazing. God is on the scene. God is on the scene. It, it's a dramatic and sudden arrival. All of a sudden, it just says he's there. It says, then, that's the way verse three starts. It says, then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the, on the Mount of Olives that lie before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olive, Olives shall be split in two from the east to the west by the ver the, uh, to, to form a very wide valley so that one half of the mount shall be moved northward and the other half southward. Now, how can that be? It's saying that God's going to be here and the Lord is going to stand on the Mount of Olives. How's that possible? I mean, God is spirit, right? Is he going to stand? Look, he's going to become a man. He's already, he's already stood on the Mount of Olives. Christ has already been, been here, and he stood on the Mount of Olives. In fact, when he ascended, that ascension was on the Mount of Olives. Christ has been here and left, ascended, and he will come back. Because he's, he's, he, 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 he's God, but certainly he's a man. Part of him is, is a, in human form. And he will return in his second coming. He's going to return as a man. And he will stand on the Mount of Olives. Now, here's what's incredible. It's talking about the Mount of Olives is going to split. That, that, it's going to, that a major catastrophe is going to happen. And it's going to cause this, this mount to split, to divide in two, and spread out, and cause this very wide valley. How is that possible? Well, this is a catastrophe. This is part of the second coming. This is a major event. This is a major event. It basically is a major earthquake that's going to spread. It's going to do something incredible. It's going to spread the Mount of Olives, the way it's talking about, where it forms a, a wide valley, and it's going to raise up Jerusalem even higher. The city will be raised up, and the, mount, the, the valley obviously is lower down. And that's going to be that's going to come through a major earth-changing event, and that is the second coming. It's a catastrophe. It is a cataclysmic, monumental event. It will form two again. It'll form. It'll be two valleys with the city of Jerusalem elevated. Verse five says that when all this occurs. You, we, shall flee, flee to the valleys of my mountain, for the valley of the mountain shall, shall reach uh, Azal. Azal means, uh, it, it, it's a basically a village uh, just on the outside of, of, uh, Mount of the Mount of Olives. It is a re, the word means reserved. So that is to where we're going to flee. You shall flee. You, uh, you shall flee from the earthquake in that day. Uh, you shall flee like you fled on the earthquake of the day of Uzziah, king of, Ju king of Judah. Apparently when the, uh, King Uzziah reigned, there was some major earthquake that terrified everyone. Well, this is going to be likened to it, if not more severe. Then he goes on to say, then, then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones, all the saints, with him. This is a prophecy. This is a prophecy of foretelling of the return of Christ in all his power, in all his glory. This is spoken about in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Remember what it said? 
Remember, remember the disciples that were with Jesus and he ascends to heaven and they're looking up at him ascending to heaven. Well, this is what it says. And while they, were, while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why are you standing looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come in the same way as you now saw him go into heaven. So Jesus will come back the same way you've seen him ascend. He's going to return. So now we got verification of, okay, the prophecy, and then we get the angels say this, or these men in white robes say it. They, he's coming back. He's coming back. This uh, That event took place on the Mount of Olives. This is the second coming. It's talking about the second coming, verses 6 and 7. On that day, there shall be no light, cold or frost. And there shall be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time there shall be light. There shall be no, on that day there shall be no light, no cold, no frost. So, so the illumination, the, the sun, the stars, all that, oh, that's going away. There's not going to be a need for that. And it talks about that in Revelation and elsewhere. Who is going to be our light? The Lord. The Lord is going to be our light. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus says, uh, uh, speaks of how the Son of God, the Son of Man will return, he says to his disciples, that he will come in the glory of his Father with all his holy angels. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14, the Apostle Paul speaks about all this. He says, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Now, again, we're getting a picture of the second coming when God calls up his holy ones, those, those who have passed away, those who have who have who have gone before us, our loved ones, and they're going to be brought up first and be re reunited into an imperishable body, and they're going to be marching in when God when Christ returns. Jesus is bringing forth an eternal kingdom, a kingdom of God. This is the coronation. When we see it coming, when we see it happening, we're going to know this is the coronation of the new king, the one and only king, coming with all his angels to be the only king on earth. Remember, only a third of us are going to be around, a third of whatever number, I don't know. But the consummation of human history, the final events, will occur when Jesus Christ returns to establish his reign over all the earth. Now, when we read about this and we read about how graphic it's going to be and how real it's going to be, what do we need to hear? What do we need to know? What do we need to hear? Well, we need to hear that when all this happens and all this takes place, that's the end of the Bible. That's the end of God's word. It ends there. It ends at the final coming, the second coming. The story is real. He's real. And should all this frighten you? Should all this terrify you? Should we be afraid and fearful? Guys, be honest, of course. We're a little terrified of that. That's, uh, that's something we don't really want to think about. Like the, those I asked this week. I'd rather not think about it. It's like saying, okay, I'm going to go through a very hard time, but I'd rather not know about the exacts until it happens, and I know God's grace will help me get through it. But that, that's what's going to happen, and God's grace will get us through it. It, 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 is a, it is God's calling for us. to. It is God's reminder to us, calling out to us to come and return to him. There's an interesting story uh, that I read the other day about a six-year-old named Bridger, uh, Bridger Walker. Uh, Bridger it was a six-year-old kid. This happened a year ago. Uh, and, and then he sees this German shepherd charging at his younger sister, just coming or growling or whatever he did. 
So what does Bridger do? Well, Bridger, again, was six years old. Bridger steps between his younger sister and the German, vicious German shepherd steps between him to protect his sister. And he's still recovering from the injuries he sustained from that dog, from that German shepherd. He's still, he's still recovering. A year later, he's still recovering, but he saved his sister. And, and so he was asked uh, why he did it. And as a seven-year-old now, I guess, he, he just said simply that if someone had to die, I, I thought it should be me. And, and see, those, those are just examples of our Savior who died for the world who died for our souls. He died for our eternity. And, and, and we're image bearers of that. And Bridger is an image bearer of that. And without hesitation, he was willing to step in front of that German shepherd and he's still recovering from the severe injuries. But that is how much love God has for us. That is the love of Christ of God, the love of Jesus Christ for us. Have you heard that message? Have you heard the gospel? Have you responded to that message? And if you responded and, and you've turned to Christ, has your journey stopped or has it, is it continuing? It needs to continue. It doesn't stop. You need to continue to be a part of his church. He's calling out to you to come. The king is coming back. He is he could be here any time. But what it gives us in the final analysis is what we're experiencing today during this worship. Shalom. Shalom. Peace. In spite of everything that's going on, in spite of what might be and what's coming, there's a peace in knowing that you're saved. We're saved eternally. There's a joy in our heart, a joyful joy in knowing that despite all the tragedies that have been taking place in our lives around us, even today, even the loss of loved ones, there's a joy in knowing that God knows he's overcome it. He's overcome sin and death. Let's pray.